The football kit is a simple concept. It comprises of a shirt, shorts, socks, boots and shin pads. This is enshrined in Law 4 of the game. FIFA has a 102-page document that details with absolutely no room for uncertainty or interpretation what is allowed and what isn't. This is all a very far cry from the white woolen shirts, trousers, socks and heavy boots of just over a hundred years ago and what there was before that. Since medieval times, folk football had been played in towns and villages. Football was originally played by the working classes and quite a violent sport. The players simply wore whatever they liked. It was often quite difficult to determine just which team someone was on. Football was very different back then and there were no set rules, meaning large groups of people could play, which usually resulted in players getting hurt. Due to the working classes having to work long hours and a series of legal prohibitions against the particularly violent folk football, from the early 19th century onwards, it found its status undermined, and eventually football became the winter game of choice for the middle and upper classes. The sport was played between residence houses of private schools in the UK, such as Winchester, Harrow, Shrewsbury, Charterhouse and Eton. The colour that each side played in usually related to the public school or university they came from. There was no Amazon back then at that time, and all the players would have their shirt individually made for them by their tailor. There were no sponsorship deals back then, and football was truly an amateur sport. So much so, even the cost of a kit was enough to put the game out of reach of the working classes. In Scotland, however, with the support of the Catholic Church, a variety of teams started up, which resulted in the game being brought back to the working class. Many football teams came from cricket, with football teams set up as a result of cricket clubs looking for a sport to play in the winter months. Early football teams played in a kit that was not too dissimilar to that of cricket and generally consisted of a shirt, flannel trousers, strong boots and a cap. Indeed, to cut down on costs, they played in the same cricket whites with caps, scarves and sashes used as a way to differentiate between the teams. As the game developed since about 1870, there was an evolution of basic uniforms, but in 1879, during the FA Cup, rules were created that specified each team must be dressed in a distinct one so spectators could distinguish between players. Throughout the latter half of the 20th century, football increased in popularity. The game and the industry grew and expanded internationally. Throughout this period, the nature of the game changed significantly. Players became fitter and stronger. Play became more creative and technical, and there were significant improvements in the skill levels. Increased competition between clubs amplified the desire to have equipment that enhanced the chances of beating one's opponent. As well as advances in technology and material, the impact of fashion, the recent explosion of the female game, and the massive revenue streams created from replica kits, TV rights, gate receipts and sponsorship, development of the football kit advanced significantly. Let's have a look at the development of the shirt. Sheffield FC, a team based in Yorkshire, England, is the world's oldest football club not associated with an institution such as a school, hospital or university. It was founded in 1857. The only one rule in 1859 on kit was a stipulation that each player must take two caps, a red and a dark blue flannel cap, so that one colour can be worn by a team. Shirts were initially called jerseys, and from the 1860s onwards, they were tight-fitting and made from knitted wool. It was not until the 1870s when the first inter-club matches were arranged that uniform kits appeared. Popular kit designs included hooped and plain shirts, then stripes which were said to make players appear taller. Towards the end of the 1800s, half kits became popular, along with the Harlequin kit with its four separate panels. At first, clubs used a variety of different designs. For example, in 1884, Bolton Wanderers wore white shirts with red spots, and then the following year they changed to red, blue and white stripes. Some teams held onto their kit design a little longer, like Preston North End, who, when they were established in 1863, played in narrow blue stripes with long white trousers. 25 years later, they changed from stripes to a white shirt. On the other hand, Blackburn Rovers, who were established in 1875, wore shirts of blue and white halves from the very beginning, and they still do to this day. As football progressed into a professional sport, 
it became the responsibility for the club to issue kits. Previously, it had been up to the individual. Eventually, a demand grew for a football kit manufacturer. The first manufacturer of sportswear in the UK was Bukta, who were established in 1879. In 1891, Wolverhampton Wanderers played Sunderland, but confusion ensued when both teams turned out in the same kit design. This led to the FA introducing the rule that clubs had to register their colours, along with insisting that all clubs have a white change of kit in the event of a clash. By the 1890s, football shirt designs had settled into a few standardised alternatives. Shirts were normally flannel et with lace collars. Aston Villa were fairly unique by preferring woollen jerseys with round necks. In 1928, Arsenal and Chelsea were two of the first teams in the league to start wearing shirt numbers. During the 1933 seasons, numbers were used for the first time in the FA Cup match between Everton and Manchester City. Everton took numbers 1-11, to 11, with City wearing 12-22. to 22. However, it was not until the 1939 season that all clubs in the Football League were mandated to wear numbers. Unfortunately, this season ended in abandonment when World War II broke out. In the 19th century, goalkeepers wore the same colours as their teammates. A new regulation was introduced in 1909 that stated goalkeepers were restricted to scarlet, blue or white jerseys. In 1912, the Football Association also gave permission for green jerseys to be worn. In 1921, the FA decided that yellow jerseys should be worn in international games. After 1980, keepers could wear just about any colour. Third kits traditionally started in European competition as a way of marking the occasion and existed in association football at least as early as the 1930s. Until 1989, the FA Cup competition rules stated, where colours of the two competing clubs are similar, both clubs must change unless alternative arrangements are mutually agreed by the competing clubs. Away kits were often similar as well, Therefore, third kits were worn in the 1948 FA Cup final by Manchester United and the 1950 final by Arsenal. Similar rules were employed by the European governing body UEFA, with Manchester United winning the 1968 European Cup final in a blue third kit. One notable incident occurred in 1996 when Manchester United changed into their blue and white third kit at half-time, with their manager Sir Alex Ferguson blaming the grey away shirt for several subpar performances. Ferguson commented the players couldn't pick each other out. Real Madrid, Coventry, Chelsea and Liverpool are a few clubs who play in a single colour kit as their home kit. The England national team sometimes plays in red shirts even when it's not required, as this was the strip worn when the team won the 1966 FIFA World Cup. In some cases, both teams have been forced to wear their second choice away kits, such as a match between the Netherlands and Brazil in the 1974 FIFA World Cup where they wore white and dark blue, rather than their first choice of orange and yellow, respectively. long sleeve shirts, which were originally the norm, are now nearly gone. But occasionally, a few players still opt to wear them. Players had their names on the shirts from 1992 onwards. Unlike modern shirts, traditional tops didn't have sponsors. It is often thought that Liverpool were the first club to sign a sponsorship deal with Itachi in 1979, but it was actually the southern club Kettering Town who were the first to do this. They were sponsored by Kettering Tyres in 1976. Unfortunately, the FA didn't approve and they were forced to remove the advertisement. From the 1990s, there were strict rules imposed banning non-approved advertising and slogans. This was after a spate of players lifting their shirts to display personal, political or religious messages on undershirts. Danish striker Nicholas Bentner celebrated his goal against Portugal in the Euro 2012 tournament by pulling up his shirt and flashing his underwear. UEFA slapped him with a €100,000 fine and a one-game ban as a result of this unauthorised advertising. Ukraine were ordered by UEFA to remove a map from their Euro 2020 shirt, which was a political statement against Russia. Black Lives Matters and poppy logos make the debate very, very complicated. One notable colour that has been absent in football kits was black. Black was reserved for the referee and linesman. However, rules were relaxed, allowing the officials to wear other colours, paving the way for clubs to wear all black kits for the first time, with both QPR and Manchester United leading the way. If you would like to know why the official is called the referee, visit my website, tabclaudane.com, to find out. The introduction of the manufacturing deals in the 1970s saw 
the average kit design span about five years. By the 1980s, this was down to two. Now most teams change their kit design every year. Abstract designs that included splashes, waves and geometric designs come and go and we have seen some wonderful designs and some not so wonderful. Remember the 1860 Munich 150 year anniversary kit filled with glorious scenes from the club's past. How about this Dutch national kit or the Manchester United zebra inspired third kit? Luckily for everyone, the laws of the game mandated sleeves be worn on shirts. In 2002, Cameroon wore a sleeveless shirt and won the Africa Cup of Nations wearing it. They were prevented from wearing the same kit design in the subsequent World Cup. Football shirts are now cut to fit tightly and are made of polyester, which is strong and durable and does not absorb rainwater. So the shirt remains lightweight, even when wet. Modern shirts are lined with moisture-wicking polyester fabrics. Systems such as Climalite, Dry Fit and Climacool have wicking linings that draw moisture from the body to evaporate at the outer surface of the shirt by capillary action, keeping the players dry, cool and comfortable throughout the match. Tight-fitting shirts help the wicking to work well. From about 1867 onwards, trousers were also abandoned for knickerbockers, which were loose trousers gathered at or just below the knee. They were made from serge, swans down or even lambskin. At the start of the 20th century, some players like Charlie Roberts of Manchester United started to wear above-the-knee shorts, known as knickers. Polite Victorian society frowned upon the new style of kit and the FA passed a rule in 1904 that required shorts to cover the knees. Roberts and some other players ignored this regulation and knickerbockers were eventually called shorts. Law 4 on football kit design doesn't stipulate the length of shorts now and indeed it is the preference of the club to design the length of their shorts. But some players still wear their shorts lower or higher than their teammates. Lionel Messi loves to wear his shorts down to his knees. Obviously the team must identify what colour short will be worn as part of which kit for each season. In the first few games of international football the Italians wore a white shirt and the players wore their club shorts. This resulted in several different colour shorts being worn by the same team. It wasn't too long before they started wearing the Savoy blue that gives them their name, Gli Azzurri. The fashion, for some reason, in the 1980s, was for tight, small shorts. Also, goalkeepers are permitted to wear tracksuit bottoms instead of shorts. The only development really in the socks has come in the stipulation of the colour and the modern materials used in their construction. In the early days, clubs did not have to wear the same colour socks. It was only in 1937 that the Football League required clubs to register the colour and design of their socks. Football socks are now designed and shaped to fit comfortably, to protect and support the leg and to cushion the foot. There is no law preventing socks being worn over the knees and indeed many players do play with them high, advantages being scratch protection and the warmth. Socks must cover entirely the shin guard and that is the reason Manchester City player Jack Grealish plays with low socks because he only wears a small pair of kids size 7 to 8 shin pads. Before the year 1891, football boots weren't in use. Instead, the players wore work boots. These were obviously not made with agility in mind and quite heavy on the foot. They weren't designed for people to run in or to kick a ball with. Furthermore, they usually had a reinforced toe cap, which led to injuries whenever players accidentally or intentionally kicked each other. They also didn't have any kind of additional grip since there was a regulation that footballers couldn't wear any shoes with anything sticking out from them. A revision around 1891 allowed football shoes to utilise small bars or studs on their shoes. Soon after that, work boots were replaced with actual football boots. They were made of thick leather and about half a kilo dry and heavier when wet. They were also laced up to the ankle for better protection. The World Wars and their aftermath left few materials and little demand for football boots. Consequently, the early decades of the 1900s saw little development of football footwear. During this time, however, Valsport and Gola were the popular brands marketed to footballers. In 1925, Adidasler, who went on to create the company Adidas, obtained his first patents, one for a running shoe with hand-forged spikes and the other for a football boot with nailed leather studs. Lighter, cut-down ankle boots favoured by the South American and Southern European footballers where conditions were a lot less muddy than England rapidly became the boot of choice. Boots started to come in a variety of materials with new designs and shaping for better performance. 
With more laws preventing foul play, the need to protect players' feet became less important. The primary concern became better agility and performance. Besides being lighter, the new football boots also came up a little lower on the leg to improve flexibility. In the 1950s, Adidas introduced their own football boot that came with screw-in studs that were interchangeable. The studs were either rubber or plastic and were specifically made to be used in different weather or field conditions. This meant that football players no longer had to take two different pairs of shoes with them. They could now use one boot with interchangeable studs instead. It was also during this period that professional footballers were receiving endorsements to wear specific brands of football boots. Pelé was once reportedly paid $120,000 to tie his shoes up just before the kickoff of the 1970 FIFA World Cup. Thanks to laser technology, football boots are now able to be customised to best fit an individual's foot. Name and event personalisation of boots is also a popular option nowadays. Shin guards protect by spreading impact loads over wider areas of the skin. The force of the initial impact is reduced as peak pressure is dampened out. It is believed that shin pads were first worn by footballers in 1874. They started as bulky, cut-down cricket pads. Now they are ultra-lightweight and unobtrusive. Fiberglass, foam rubber and polyurethane have become the norm for shin pad construction. Different player positions use shin guards to provide different types of protection and fit. Defenders need a heavier shin guard with the extra ankle protection. Midfielders need protection but also need to be able to move freely. Forwards need a light shin guard with protection and ankle support. Goalkeepers often wear a light shin guard with minimal protection. So, what is the future of football kits? Considering men simply wore their working clothes when football first took off as an organised sport, the journey has been long to where we are today with technical kits and the rigorous regulations and laws. It is difficult to see much more significant change or development in the football kit. However, the revenue from sports equipment kit and replica kit is mind-boggling. And the sports brands can reach many millions of players and spectators around the world through sponsorship. And so, manufacturers and designers are continually developing new and improved versions of the five simple basic items, keeping the wheels of the industry turning. Manchester City recently revealed a third kit, which could be best described as a t-shirt, not a football shirt, trying to make the crossover into mainstream or high street fashion. I wonder what footballers will be wearing in 100 years from now. If you are interested in sport, you should get my book that contains thousands of the best sports facts and jokes. New films are on their way, so consider subscribing and turning on the notifications to make sure you don't miss them. Hit the like button because it makes me happy. See you soon.